Hi everyone, this is Mrs. J and I'm doing a read aloud of Out of the Dust by Karen Hess. And we're on Spring 1935. We're starting on page 153. Heartsick. The hard part is, in spite of everything, if I had any boy court me, it'd be Mad Dog Craddock. But Mad Dog can have any girl. Why would he want me? I'm so restless. My father asks what's going on with me. I storm up to my room, leaving him alone, standing in the kitchen. If Ma was here, she would come up and listen, and then later she would curl up beside my father and assure him that everything was all right, and soothe him into his farmer's sleep. My father and I, we can't soothe each other. I'm too young. He's too old. And we don't know how to talk anymore, if we ever did. April 1935 Skin my father has a raised spot on the side of his nose that was never there before and won't go away. There's another on his cheek and two more on his neck. And I wonder why the heck he is fooling around. He knows what it is. His father had those spots too. April 1935 Regrets I never go by Arlie's anymore. Still, every week he comes to school to teach, and sometimes I bump into Vera or Miller Rice or Mad Dog. They are always kind. They ask after my father. They ask how my hands are feeling. I cross my arms in front of me tight so my scars won't show. These days, Mad Dog looks at me halfway between picking a fight and kindness. He walks with me a ways some afternoons, never says a word. He's quiet once the other girls go off. I've had enough of quiet men. I ought to keep clear of Mad Dog, but I don't. April 1935 fire on the rails. I hate fire. Hate it. But the entire Oklahoma panhandle is so dry, everything is going up in flames. Everything too ready to ignite. Last week, the school caught fire. Damage was light, on account of it being caught early. Most kids joked about it the next day, but it terrified me. I could hardly go back in the building. And this week, three boxcars in the train yard burned to ash. Jim Going and Harry Kessler spotted the fire, and that was a miracle, considering the fierceness of the dust storm at the time. The fire boys tore over, but they couldn't put out the blaze without water, and water is exactly what they didn't have. So they separated the burning cars and moved them down a siding away from any little thing that might catch it if the flames hopped. It was all they talked about at school. The dust blew, they say, so you'd think they would have smothered the fire out, but the flames crazy like the wind, licked away the wooden frames of the three boxcars until nothing remained but warped metal and twisted rails, scorched dirt, and charred ties. No one talks about fire right to my face. They can't forget how fire changed my life, but I hear them talking anyway. April 1935 The Mail Train They promised through rain, heat, snow, and gloom, but they never said anything about dust. And so the mail got stuck for hours, for days, on the Santa Fe because the mountains of dust had blown over the tracks because blizzards of dust blocked the way. And all that time as the dust beat down on the cars, a letter was waiting inside a mailbag. A letter from Aunt Ellis, my father's sister, written just to me, inviting me to live with her in Lubbock. I want to get out of here. But not to Aunt Ellis, and not to Lubbock, Texas. My father didn't say much when I asked him what I should do. Let's wait and see, he said. What's that supposed to mean? April 1935 Migrants We'll be back when the rain comes, they say, pulling away with all they own, straining the springs of their motor cars. Don't forget us. And so they go, fleeing the blowing dust, fleeing the fields of brown-tipped wheat, barely ankle-high, and sparse as the hair on a dog's belly. We'll be back, they say, pulling away toward Texas, Arkansas, where they can rent a farm, pull in enough cash, maybe to start again. We'll be back when it rains, they say, setting out their bed springs and mattresses, their cook stoves and dishes, their kitchen tables, and their milk goats, tied to their running boards and rickety cages, settling out for California, where even though they say they'll come back, they just might stay, if what they hear about the place is true. Don't forget us, they say, but there are so many leaving. How can I remember them all? April 1935 Blankets of Black 
On the first day clear, we staggered out of our caves of dust into the sunlight, turning our faces to the big blue sky. On the second clear day, we believed the worst was over at last. We flocked outside, traded in town, going to stores and coming out only to find the air still clear and gentle, grateful for each easy breath. On the third clear day, summer came in April, and the churches opened their arms to all comers, and all comers came. After church, folks headed for picnics, car trips. No one could stay inside. My father and I argued about the funeral of Grandma Lucas, who truly was no relation, but we ended up going anyway, driving down the road in a procession to Texahoma. Six miles out of town, the air turned cold. Birds beat their wings. Everywhere you looked, whole flocks dropping out of the sky, crowding on fence posts. I was sulking in the truck beside my father when heaven's shadow crept across the plains. A black cloud, big and silent as Montana, boiling on the horizon and barreling toward us. Most birds tumbled from the sky, frantically keeping ahead of the dust. We watched as the storm swallowed the light. The sky turned from blue to black. Night descended in an instant and the dust was on us. The wind screamed. The blowing dirt ran so thick I couldn't see from the brim of my hat as we plunged from the truck, fleeing. The dust swarmed like it had never swarmed before. My father groped for my hand, pulled me away from the truck, and we ran. A blind pitching toward the shelter of a small house, almost invisible, our hands tight together. Running toward the ghostly door, pounding on it with desperation. A woman opened her home to us, all of us. Not just me and my father, but the entire funeral procession. And one after another, we tumbled inside, gasping, our lungs burning for the want of air. All the lamps were lit against the dark. The house, dazed by dust, gazed weakly out. The walls shook in the howling wind. We helped tack up sheets in the windows and doors to keep the dust down. Cars and trucks unable to go on, their ignitions shorted out by static electricity, opened up and let out more passengers, who stumbled for shelter. One family came in clutched together, their pa driving the path with a long wooden rod. If it hadn't been for the company, this storm would have broken us completely, broken us more thoroughly than the plow had broken Oklahoma sod, more thoroughly than my burns had broken the ease of my hands. But for the sake of the crowd and the hospitality of the home that sheltered us, we held on and waited, sitting or standing, breathing through wet cloths as the fog of the dust filled the room and settled slowly over us. When it let up a bit, some went on to bury Grandma Lucas, but my father and I, we cleaned the thick layer of grime off the truck, pulled out of the procession and headed home, creeping slowly along the dust-mounted road. When we got back, we found the barn half covered in dunes. I couldn't tell which rise of dust was Ma and Franklin's grave. The front door hung open, blown by the wind. Dust lay two feet deep in ripply waves across the parlor floor. Dust had blanketed the cook stove, the ice box, the kitchen stairs, everything deep in dust, in the piano, buried in dust. While I started to shovel, my father went out to the barn. He came back, and when I asked, he said the animals weren't good. And the tractor was dusted out. And I said, it's a wonder the truck got us home. I should have held my tongue. When he tried starting the truck again, it wouldn't turn over. April 1935. The visit. Mad Dog came by to see how he made out after the duster. But he didn't come to court me. I didn't think he had. We visited more than an hour. The sky cleared enough to see Black Mesa. I showed him my father's pond. Mad Dog says he was going to Amarillo to sing on the radio. And if he sang good enough, they might give him a job there. You'd leave the farm, I asked. He nodded. You'd leave school? He shrugged. Mad Dog scooped a handful of dust like a boy in a sand pit. He said, I love this land no matter what. I looked at his hands. They were scarless. Mad Dog stayed longer than he'd planned. He ran down the road back to his father's farm when he realized the time. Dust rose each place where his foot fell, leaving a trace of him long after he'd gone. April 1935. Freak Show. The fellow from Canada, James Kingsbury, photographer from the Toronto Star, way up there in Ontario, 
The man who took the first pictures of the Dion quintuplets left his homeland and came to Joyce City looking for some other piece of oddness, hoping to photograph the drought and the dust storms, and he did, with the help of Bill Rotterdaw and Handy Pool, who took him to the sandiest farms and showed off the boniest cattle in the country. Mr. Kingberry's pictures of those Dion babies got them famous, but it also got them taken from their mother and father, put on display like a freak show, like a tent full of two-headed calves. Now I'm wondering what will happen to us after he finishes taking pictures of our dust. April 1935. Help from Uncle Sam. The government is lending us money to keep the farm going, money to buy seed, feed loans for our cow, for our mule, for the chicken still alive and the hog, as well as a little bit of feed for us. My father was worried about paying back because of what Ma had said, but Mrs. Love, the lady from Farah, assured him that he didn't need to pay a single cent until the crops came in. And if the crops never came in, then he wouldn't pay a thing. So my father said okay, anything to keep going. He put the paperwork on the shelf, beside Ma's book of poetry, and the invitation from Aunt Ellis. He just keeps that invitation from her, glowering down from me on the shelf above the piano. April 1935 Let Down I was invited to graduation to play piano. I couldn't play. It had been too long. My hands wouldn't work. I just sat at the piano bench, staring down at the keys. Everyone waited. When the silence went on for so long, folks started to whisper. Ardley Wanderdale lowered his head, and Miss Freelance started to cry. I don't know. I let them down. I didn't cry. Too stubborn. I got up and walked off the stage. I thought maybe if my father ever went to Doc Rice to do something about the spots in his skin, Doc could check my hands too and tell me what to do about them. But my father isn't going to Doc Rice, and now I think we're both turning to dust. May 1935 Hope It started out as snow. Oh, big flakes floating softly, catching on my sweater, lacy on the edges of my sleeves. Snow covered the dust, softened the fences, soothed the parched lips of the land. And then it changed halfway between snow and rain, sleet glazing the earth, until at last it slipped into rain, light as a mist. It was the kindest kind of rain that fell, soft and then a little heavier, helping along what had already fallen into the hard pan earth until it rained steady as a good friend who walks beside you, not getting in your way, staying with you through a hard time. And because the rain came so patient and slow at first, and built up strength as the earth remembered how to yield instead of washing off, the water slid into the dying ground and softened its stubborn pride and eased it back toward life. And then, just when we thought it would end, after three such gentle days of rain, came slamming down tons of it, soaking the ready earth to the primed and greedy earth and soaking deep. It kept coming, thunder booming, lightning, kicking, dancing from the heavens down the prairie. And my father, dancing with it, dancing outside in the drenching night with gutters racing, with the earth puddled and pleased, with my father's near-finished pond filling. When the rain stopped, my father splashed out into the barn and spent two days and two nights cleaning dust out of his tractor until he got it running again. In the dark headlights shining, he idled toward the freshened fields, certain the grass would grow again, certain the weeds would grow again, certain the wheat would grow again too. May 1935 The Rain's Gift the rain has brought back some grass, and the ranchers have put away the feed cake and sent their cattle out to graze. Joe de la Flor is singing in his saddle again. May 1935 Hope Smothered While I washed up dinner dishes in the pan, the wind came from the west, bringing dust. I just stripped all the gummed tape from the windows. Now I've got dust all over the clean dishes. I can hardly make myself get started cleaning again. Mrs. Love is taking applications for boys to do CCC work. Any boy between 18 and 28 can join. I'm too young and the wrong sex. But of what I wouldn't give to be working for the CCC, somewhere far from here, out of the dust. 
May 1935. Sunday afternoon at the Amarillo Hotel. Everybody gathered at the Joyce City Hardware and Furniture Company on Sunday to hear Mad Dog Craddock sing on WDAG from the Amarillo Hotel. They hooked up speakers and the sweet sound of Mad Dog's voice filled the creaky aisles. Arlene Wanderdale was in Amarillo with Mad Dog, singing and playing the piano, and the Black Mesa boys were there too. I ached for not being there with them. But there was nothing most more most folks in Joy City wanted to do than spend a half hour leaning on counters, sitting on stairs, resting in chairs, sitting at the hardware and at the tableware, listening to the hometown boys make it big time music on the radio. They kept time in the aisles, hooting after each number, and when Mad Dog finished his last song, they sent the dust swirling, cheering and whooping, patting each other on the back, as if they'd been featured on WDAG themselves. I tried cheering for Mad Dog with everyone else, but my throat felt like a trap had snapped down on it. That Mad Dog, he didn't have a thing to worry about. He sang good all right. He'll go as far as he wants. May 1935 Baby Funny thing about babies. Ma died having one. The Lindbergh said good night to one and lost it and somebody last Saturday decided to give one away. Reverend Binghamham says that Hardly Madden was sweeping the dust out of the church, shining things up for Sunday service, when he swept himself up to a package on the north front steps. He knelt, studying the parcel, and calling to Reverend Binghamham, who came right by and opened the package up. It held a living baby. Reverend Binghamham told Doc Rice. Doc checked it and said it was fine, only small less than a five-pound sack of sugar, and a little cold from spending time on the north front step. But Mrs. Binghamham and the Reverend warned that the baby with the blankets and the sugar water warmed the baby with blankets and sugar water and tender talk, and the, wh- and the whole of Joyce City came forward with gifts. I asked my father if we could adopt it, but he said we stood about as much of a chance of getting that baby as wheat stood of growing, since we couldn't give the baby anything, not even a ma. Then he looked at me, sorry as dust, and to make up for it, he pulled out a box with the rest of the clothes Ma had made for our new baby and told me to drop them by the church if I wanted. I found dimes Ma's, I found the dimes Ma had been saving, my earnings from the piano, inside an envelope in the box of Baby Franklin's nighties. She had kept those dimes to send me to Panhandle A&M to study music. No point now. I sat at her piano a long time after I got back from the church, imagining a song for my little brother, buried in Ma's arms on a knoll overlooking the banks of the beaver, imagining a song for the Lindenberg baby stiff in the woods, imagining a song for this new baby who would not be my father's son. May 1935 Old Bones Once dinosaurs roamed in Simron County, Bones showing in their green shale, ribs the size of plow blades, hip bones like crank phones, legs running like fence rails down to a giant foot. A chill shoots up my spine, imagining a dinosaur slogging out of an Oklahoma sea, with sea turtles swimming around its legs. I can see it stunning itself on the swampy banks, beyond the forest of ferns. It's almost easy to imagine, gazing out from our house at the dust-crushed fields, Easy to imagine filling in all the emptiness with green. Easy to imagine such a beast brushing an itchy rump against our barn. But all that remains of it is bone. Broken and turned to stone, trapped in the hillside, this once upon a time real live dinosaur who lived and fed and roamed like a ridiculous long-necked cow and then fell down and died. I think for a moment of Joe de la Flor herding brontosauruses instead of cattle and I smile. I tell my father, let's go to the site and watch the men chip away with ice picks. Let's see how they plaster the bones, please, before they ship the whole thing to Norman. I am thinking that a dinosaur is getting out of Joyce City, a hundred million years too late to appreciate the trip, and that I ought to get out before my own bones turn to stone, but I keep my thoughts to myself. My father thinks a while, rubbing that spot in his neck. He looks out the window, out across the field toward the knoll where Ma and the baby lie. It's best to let the dead rest, he says, and we stay home. June 1935